You know, if you have Clay Worst in front of you, you have to get from him his crazy Jake story. I mean, we've had it from everybody else. So let's hear what Clay has to say. You know, Clay, everybody's got a story about Crazy Jake. Did you ever meet him? Well, Crazy Jake, his name was Robert Jacob. They say Jacobs, but his name was actually Jacob. I don't know how Jake got out here, but he was actually from back east somewhere. May have had a little legal background, I don't know. But he went back in the superstitions looking for lost gold. And it's kind of interesting because the first time I ever met Jake, he always carried a double barrel sawed off shotgun, which loaded with buckshot as a pretty formidable weapon. Well, I was come out of the superstitions and I met Jake coming in, carrying this double barreled shotgun. And he introduced himself. He said, I'm known as Crazy Jake. And he says, I'm working a mine right over here in the Red Hills. And he said, you know, there's a Spanish mine in the Red Hills. He said, a fellow named Clay Worst, who was a local historian here, had done some research and he found, came into some Spanish records of a survey called the Salazar Survey that was done in 1854, I believe after this country had become a part of the United States. It was Mexico up until the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. And according to, to Clay Worst, the Mexicans came up here and made a clandestine trip into the superstitions and opened up a mine which they did not own and actually brought a, a primitive camera with the chemicals to sensitize the plates and made photographs of a, a pinnacle they called El Sombrero, presumably Weaver's Needle, and a photograph taken of El Sombrero from the mine site, and actually ran a survey that a fellow named uh, Cristobal Peralta showed up in Florence, well, in Tucson originally, in 1924 and said that he had family records of a mine operated in what is now the Superstition Mountains by his family when this was still a part of old Mexico. He spoke no English. He needed an interpreter. They sent him to a man named Perfecto Salazar in Florence. Perfecto was a court interpreter for the, the superior court, so he actually spoke both fluent Spanish and English, and he was immediately hired by Perfecto, by uh, Cristobal Peralta. They first examined the records at the courthouse at Florence, then at Phoenix, looking for some possible color of title that Peralta might have to these mines, found nothing. Before Peralta gave up and left, he said, I would like to see this pinnacle that they called El Sombrero. So Salazar drove him, I think with a Model T, out up what's now called the Apache Trail, Highway 88, to a spot where you can see Weaver's Needle back in the superstitions, and explained to Peralta that was probably the El Sombrero that he was looking for. At that point, Peralta showed Salazar a map, didn't allow him to copy it, but it showed this pinnacle, El Sombrero. It showed the Rio Salado, the Salt River, and it showed to the north of the Salt River, Cuatro Picachos, four peaks. And between the pinnacle El Sombrero and the river was a mine. And there were the numbers 4 and 62 between the pinnacle and the mine. And then between the mine and the river, there was the number 7. And uh, Peralta did not explain what these figures meant to 
Salazar and did not allow him to copy the map. But Peralta evidently left and went back to Spain or Mexico. Salazar thought that maybe these numbers meant something. So he went back there and tried to search for the mine and was appalled when he found how big that country is back there. So he got a surveyor, a man named Bartlett, went back there and they didn't know what the 4 and 62 meant. And he thought it might be 4 kilometers and 62 meters. And he wanted Bartlett to measure out that distance. And Bartlett objected. He said, you don't express things that way in the metric system. So many kilometers and so many meters. If it was that distance, you would have said it was 4.62 kilometers or 4,062 meters. He said, you've got this wrong. But since he was getting paid, regardless of how the survey turned out, he went ahead and ran that distance, ended up in what they call the Red Hills. So Crazy Jake, when I met him up on the bull trail up there, is explaining this all to me, that Clayworth did this, Clayworth did that, and Clayworth ran this survey up there himself, brought a transit in here, and actually ran the survey that Clayworth had all this stuff, but he just wasn't able to put it together. Well, he said, I've put it together. He said, I've found the mine. And he says, I've built a camp up there, a little board shack, and I'm putting a shaft down up there. And uh, he said he'd have to be on his way. It was getting along in the day. And so we parted, and we walked about 30 yards apart, 20 yards apart. And he said, I say, I didn't get your name. I said, I'm Clay Worst. <laughs> Jake, just if he'd have worn dentures, he'd have dropped him. <laughs> so we both had a good laugh and we both went our way. But the thing that was interesting, I did run that survey. And strangely, I, strangely, I found a spot up there where I had an old Fisher metal detector that I'd bought in... 1940s from Gerhard Fischer, the old man himself, a very crude null balance. That thing weighed probably 15 or 20 pounds. You're talking about the one that's in the museum? Down in the museum. And I found a place where I got an indication. So we did put a hole down there. We went down, oh, probably 10 or 12 feet. And it proved to be just a vein of, of decomposed granite that carried no values, no gold that you could see at least. But it held ground moisture, and the early Fisher metal detectors are very sensitive to ground moisture. That's all it was. But there was a, a foot wall, pretty soft material in this hole. And I don't know why I did it. I wasn't trying to deceive anybody. But that stuff was soft, and I had a prospector's pick, and I just noticed how soft it was. And just for no reason, I cut a cross, a Roman cross, in that foot wall. Well, that's what Crazy Jake found. And he thought he'd found a Spanish mine, that that was a Spanish cross. So that's how, that's how I met Crazy Jake, and that's how Crazy Jake met Clay Worst. <laughs> oh, dear. I've heard all these stories about Crazy Jake finding gold bars up there. What do you know about that? Crazy Jake finally ended up on Malapai with a story that he'd found a cave back there with brush in front of the entrance. And inside that cave were gold bars, doby bars, stacked up in there, average about 47 pounds apiece. And he had all these gold bars. And of course, now he needed financing to go in there and bring all this gold out. So he was going around the valley area here, uh, offering people 300% return in 60 days. <laughs> 
if they'd come up with money to finance his going in there and bringing out these gold bars. And there were many prominent people, doctors, lawyers, prominent people. Jake probably promoted more than anywhere from three to five million dollars from investors. And not one of them thought to ask Jake, why didn't you bring out one bar and sell it and then you'd have the money to bring out all the rest of them? They never thought of that. And Bob Corbin was the attorney general then. Bob was a friend of mine. And they finally prosecuted. They got somebody to testify against Jake and they sent him to the penitentiary for fraud. But Bob told me it was difficult getting people to testify against Jake. I said, why? Because they were fear of retribution that if they testified against him that he might take violent action. And they said, no. He said they were still clinging to the hope that maybe there were gold bars back there. But of course there were not. All right, what's the story about Crazy Jake coming back from the dead? The final episodes of the Crazy Jake story, Tom Collinborn, a very well-known local historian, uh, Tom is undoubtedly one of the best, best authorities on the history of Superstition Mountain of anybody alive. And after Crazy Jake had died and was buried, Tom had a phone call one day. He answered the phone. He said, who is this? And the boy said, this is Jake. And Tom said, you're supposed to be dead. And he said, yeah, that's what everybody thinks. And they held a long conversation. And Tom told, told me, he said, I honestly believe I was talking to crazy Jake that somehow he had faked his death. And Tom shook his head. He said, I, I still believe I was talking to Crazy Jake. So there's my Crazy Jake story. <laughs> Thank you, Clay, for sharing your stories about Crazy Jake. You know, Crazy Jake was really crazy and still remains one of those mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. <laughs>